catch is we've been going about thinking about this problem wrong. If we look at pain and we look at depression, all right, pain's costing us about $600 billion a year. Depression alone is costing us about $100 billion a year. The comorbidity of these problems is extremely high, about 50 to 65 percent. And then if you look at people who have just pain or just depression, our success rate in getting them better is actually abysmal. It's at 47 percent. So we're not even getting half the people really cured. If we look at people who are suffering with chronic pain and suffering with chronic depression at the same time, that success rate drops to 9 percent. Absolutely abysmal. The heart of the problem is that we're thinking about these problems wrong. And the scientific evidence, the studies show that really what we're looking at is these diseases are symptoms. They're not diseases unto themselves, but rather symptoms of a brain on fire, a brain that's inflamed, the consequences of which are depression, sleep disturbances, gastrointestinal problems, such as irritable bowel syndrome, problems with focus and concentration, problems with fatigue. So there's a wide range of symptoms that result from this chronic inflammation in the central nervous system, pain and depression foremost among them. So what I tell other physicians is that if we think about this as manifestations, as symptoms of neuroinflammatory disease, the next question becomes, what is it that creates inflammation? Well, in the brain, inflammation is primarily mediated by neuroimmune cells called the microglia. And so then if we step back and we say, okay, if microglia are causing the inflammation of the brain, what causes microglia to become activated? And then the answer to that is a wide range of things. So hypoxia, such as we see in sleep apnea, problems with ischemia. Well, ischemia, we think about loss of blood supply in terms of strokes, certainly an issue, but more commonly in POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. These people lose blood supply to their brain frequently throughout the day. Other problems include traumas, which come in the form of physical traumas, such as concussions, and problems such as uh, psychological traumas. We know that long-term stress results in degeneration of the central nervous system. So there's a wide range of things, and if we understand what's creating the problems in terms of causing the inflammatory factors to be tripped off in the central nervous system, that changes our history. That changes our ability to intervene in a lot of different ways. So that if we know that problems, toxicity issues such as exposure to heavy metals, toxicity issues such as exposure to mold toxins, being able to ask that as part of our questions in our history taking now allows us to take a very different perspective on ways in which we could potentially intervene and help these individuals. Things that we don't think about, we think about pain, we don't necessarily think about celiac disease. Okay? The fact is, Fully, 15% of people with celiac disease will present with only neurologic symptoms and not gastrointestinal symptoms. And so we need to be asking questions about their diet. We need to be asking questions about gastrointestinal function. We need to be asking questions about sleep. And it's all coming together in one picture because it's all one unified physiology. So we spent way too much time focused on thinking about sleep, I'm sorry, thinking about chronic pain and thinking about depression and not enough time thinking about the underlying physiology, which is a neuroinflammatory disease. So the keys to successful treatment are actually many. The first is history, history, history. We actually have to get a very clear understanding of what an individual has gone through and what are the potentially cumulative things that have occurred that have led them to the point of seeing us. What do I mean by that? For example, I had a patient come in to see me uh, who had severe complex regional pain syndrome that had evolved into a generalized pain phenomenon. All right, she'd been through multiple hospitalizations, multiple workups, and not been getting a lot of successful treatment. Her problem started when she got kicked in the knee when she was 15 years old. All right? Now, the overwhelming majority of kids who get kicked in the knee recover fine, never have a problem. So what's going on with this child? What we found when we pushed back in history is that she had had two cases of Lyme disease when she was 10 and 8 years old and a case of a poisonous spider bite. When we looked at this from a toxicity standpoint, what we were able to do is treat the toxic issues, resolve the problem, all of her pain went away, and that was the end of the story. Okay, now she's recovered, now she's without pain, now she's back in school and fully functional. I had another kid come to see me who had problems with severe depression had attempted to kill himself on a couple of occasions, unresponsive to all of the anti, oh, I'm sorry, all of the antidepressant medications. What we found on him is he had celiac disease. 
when we addressed the celiac disease, got rid of gluten from his diet, all of the symptoms went away. He is now off all antidepressant medications. He is back fully functional. We need to think of these as neuroinflammatory diseases. So now, what does that mean? Our histories are about asking, do you have any problems with food allergies and gastrointestinal problems? Do you have problems with sleep disturbances? We do an Epworth. Epworth is a very quick screen. Do you fall asleep during the day, during meetings? Do you fall asleep sitting at a stop sign? Do you fall asleep reading books? Do you fall asleep watching TV? We're trying to get a quick assessment to find out whether or not there's sleep disturbances. Do you have unrefreshing sleep? How many hours are you sleeping? So expanding our history so that we're now doing a much more comprehensive review of what's going on with people, all well within the preview of family physicians. I'm a family physician originally by training, and I think actually family docs are among the best suited to be able to treat pain in a truly comprehensive manner. But I think the place to really start again is with a comprehensive history with the patient. You're going to need to spend a little bit more time with these people. You're going to need to spend at least 45 minutes sitting down and getting an idea of what their sleep looks like, what their diet looks like, well, <clears throat> any stressors that are going on in their lives, and then be able to address them in a far more comprehensive manner. If you do that, you'll find success in at least half of those patients without having to refer them on to the specialist pastor.